When I was five or six, I asked my mother about religion. I had become curious about the churches in our town, around which on the weekends clustered well-heeled, sandy-haired congregants clad in topes and acrus. What is church? I asked, and she answered that it was a place where people went to practice their religion. What is religion? I pressed. That drew a pause. A lot of beautiful pictures and stories, she eventually said. Some of them are very scary. People have been looking at them for a long, long time. They use them to make sense of the world. Are the pictures and stories real? I asked. No, she said flatly, not missing a beat. A few years later, my mother shed her skin, leaving domesticity behind to go back to school and earn a graduate degree in art history. Something was stirring in her. Months earlier, she'd torn an image of a David Hockney swimming pool, monochromatic blue, more cornflower than aqua, from an art magazine and stuck it with a magnet to the fridge beneath some words she'd cut from an advertisement in the newspaper. Other worlds do exist. While she read or checked out books, my sisters and I played hushed games of hide-and-seek among the Rutgers Library carols and went on group excursions to the hallway water fountain, dragging our Velcro sneakers along the carpet to make static electricity to administer little shocks. Mommy shot us a serious look if we were getting too noisy, and we fell in line, shushing one another. Sometimes at night after dinner, we were enlisted to quiz her for exams from a giant stack of index cards on which she'd written the names of painters on one side and paintings on the other in her pretty, efficient, semi-script handwriting. In my memory, the stack of index cards was as high as my knees, but it couldn't have actually been that tall. Some of the images in her textbooks were the same ones I knew she'd been talking about when we discussed religion. All those beautiful pictures and stories, angels and fire and breasts. My mother wrote her thesis about representations of women during westward expansion, and for half a year there were books scattered around the house or stacked on the dining room table depicting these embattled souls. Women's struggles and women's dreams were a theme in our home. There were three of us girls, ducklings toddling in a row, and our mother and her index cards, and we all wanted so much. In her master's thesis, plucked from a box during one of her post-divorce moves, my mother sought to grant interiority and depth to women who'd been painted out of their complexity, their humanity. The hardy pioneer family was the primary civilizing agent at the center of the violent, racist doctrine of manifest destiny— but the women at the helm of these families were rendered by men without agency. Many were small and peripheral, specks of femininity, representing something without actually being anything. The frontier painters drew on Christian iconography, and my mother cataloged the female figures they painted as frontier madonnas, happy nesters, and captives. Then she used the accounts in pioneer women's diaries to demonstrate how rich and how difficult their experiences actually were. To their blurred faces and windswept skirts, she added the details of their exhaustion, determination, fear, and hope. She asserted that they had as much expertise as their intrepid hunter husbands, who, along with their horses, were always depicted in action, upright, dynamic, and strong. It was an admirable act of recuperation. I grew up believing there is always more to the story. I was primed to be interested in women's history, and particularly in the spaces where it seemed there ought to be a women's history, yet there was nothing. I suppose I was trained by my mother to remember that other worlds exist, to always look at the woman frozen in the window and wonder what her life was like. I grew up in love with women's stories, with the ways their labor made itself visible everywhere, even when men would prefer to pretend that it wasn't the scaffolding of their very existence. I was especially taken with their anger. At 13, my friends and I became riot girls. We were hormonal, stewing in new bodily shames, processing the experiences of sexual assault we'd already had by the handful. We embarked on an ambitious regimen of at-home piercing, bleaching, head shaving. I was reading nightly from a hardbound, second-hand copy of Sisterhood is Powerful and having my mind blown. And then I ordered the first Bikini Kill LP from Kill Rockstars, and we listened to it on my parents' record player, draped on the den futon, and our lives changed forever.